Hi guys, so I just wanna do a quick video today and talk about how I am heating my workshop. This has been an issue for me for years now. Uh, how the heck do I work in a workshop in a northern climate comfortably in the winter time? So I think I finally solved my heating problems and I just wanted to share some of those with you in this video, maybe to give you some ideas. I had a lot of you ask about how I'm heating my workshop due to some of my recent posts on Instagram and uh, wondering exactly what I was doing in order to heat the space and maintain the comfortable 60 degree temperature in here that I like working in. So first things first, let's discuss what does heating a workshop actually mean? Because it can mean different things to different people in different circumstances. For me in this video, it means that I'm keeping my 24 by 32 foot two and a half car completely detached garage heated 24 seven from about 45 to 50 degrees when I'm not in here and up to about 60 degrees or so when I am working in here. For me, 60 degrees is a very good working temperature. I'm currently wearing a short sleeve shirt and a long sleeve t-shirt and this is completely comfortable in here for me to make videos and do the things that I need to do in here on a regular basis. Now I found for me that once I start letting the temperature drop below 45 degrees it takes a whole lot longer for it to come back up to that comfortable 60 degree working temperature and I don't think it is or as efficient of a way to uh, heat a space. I think it's better to just maintain um, relatively close to your optimal temperature and then heat it back up to that optimal temperature once you're inside the space. Now next I wanted to touch on insulation. My workshop at this point in time is pretty well insulated. Uh, my workshop before was not well insulated. It had insulation in here but it was not well insulated. I had rigid foam R10 in the ceiling that the previous owner had put in as well as denim insulation in the walls. Um, neither of those two things were installed very well at all. A lot of the denim insulation that was installed in the walls was all matted down. There was air gaps around the top and bottom sills. Nothing was cut out correctly and there was a lot of air gaps. In the ceiling, all of the rigid foam insulation that was in the ceiling had a lot of the same issues. There was air gaps everywhere and um, a lot of that heated air would just end up rising up into the attic space and dissipating and it really didn't do a good job whatsoever. Um, at insulating this space. Now I actually worked in this garage for a couple of years uh, with the poor insulation and heated it while I was in here working with all of that poor insulation. So I have a little bit of experience in heating the same exact space with it being poorly insulated as well as with it being well insulated. And the difference is staggering. The difference in fuel usage now is about a third of what it used to be. So before I would only heat this space when I was working in here and I would let it drop back down to whatever temperature it dropped down to uh, overnight, which would definitely be below freezing. And then I'd have to heat it back up again the next day. My fuel usage now is again about a third of what it used to be uh, with it being properly insulated. So if you're debating on whether or not to insulate your workshop, uh, definitely do it. Even if your workshop is insulated, but it's poorly insulated, insulate it properly because it makes a huge difference in your overall uh, heating uh, fuel usage costs. So to give you a quick example here, let's just say for instance that in order to heat this space 24 seven with it poorly insulated how it was before, it would have cost me around $300. It is costing me now about $100. So the difference there is massive. Now, how much did it cost me to insulate this place properly? Well, I had to rip out all of the old insulation and put in all new fiberglass insulation everywhere and make sure that everything was air sealed. Everything was lofted properly. There was no air gaps anywhere. All of the insulation was covering behind all the electrical boxes and all of the lighting. All of that stuff is super important to uh, make sure that you have a properly insulated space. It cost me about $800 for the insulation in the ceilings and about $700 for all of the new insulation in the walls. So about $1,500 um, all totaled for everything involved in insulating this space. So if you look at that, how much it actually saves me in uh, heating this place 24-7. Um, all of this insulation is gonna break even or pay for itself in about two years. Uh, we're already almost through the first year here. Uh, we've got another couple of months worth of heating to do. And then next year will actually be the break even year. So anything after that point is going to be cost savings. Now I've currently been experimenting with some different fuel types and heaters in my workspace. 
All of these options are fairly cheap, so let me show them to you, and then I'll give you a cost breakdown on what they cost to run. So the first fuel source I wanna talk about is electric. A lot of guys have electric heaters. This is a 3000 watt, 240 volt electric heater that I temporarily installed just to experiment with. I actually bought it for something else and decided how does it work out here in the garage and installed it real quickly. And believe it or not, this is approximately 10,000 BTUs and it heats this space 100%. I could heat this entire workshop with a 3000 watt, a uh, little over 10,000 BTU um, electric heater. This is not a garage specific electric heater, but the garage specific resistive type electric heaters are extremely cheap um, for the unit themselves. The wiring and possibly the electrician in order to install them, it's gonna be a lot more expensive, uh, but these are pretty cheap options to install. It's probably, especially if you have a sub panel relatively close, it's probably gonna be the cheapest option for you to install. To, to physically get heat into your garage, sort of. We'll talk about that more in a minute. This is great. All you have to do is come in here, you flip a switch and the heat's on. And when you leave here, you flip a switch and the heat's off. It also has a thermostat, which most of them do. Thermostats are relatively uh, easy to install on um, electric heaters like this. So this is a very simple, relatively cheap option to get you up and going for heat. The downside to electric, and again, we'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, is that electric for me is the most expensive fuel source that I can possibly use in here. This little 3000 watt electric heater costs me about, this little 3000 watt electric heater costs me about 45 cents per hour to run. Now I'll give you a cost per BTU breakdown here at the end uh, to show you exactly how much each of these fuel sources cost me. Um, if they were all equal, I'll, again, I'll talk about that in a second, but this cost me about this 3000 watt heater cost me 45 cents per hour to run. Now, most of the garage specific electric heaters are gonna, not going to be 3000 watts. They're going to be like 5000 or 7000 watts, 7500 watts. So you can imagine how expensive these are to run when we're talking about doubling this. So double this would be uh, uh, 6,000 watts, so a 7,500 watt heater would cost over double uh, what this one costs to run per hour. That is not cheap no matter how you slice it. Maybe you have really cheap electric rates um, where you live, but I definitely don't. I have very expensive electric rates. Needless to say, this one doesn't get run. And I'm probably gonna take this down and uh, use it for what I intended it to be used for. So. Take this down and uh, get rid of it. So the next fuel source here is gonna be propane, liquid propane, LP. If I refer to this as gas, I mean propane, not natural gas. This is propane. So don't give me crap in the comments if I accidentally say gas. But anyway, I like this heater for a couple of reasons. For one, this is a 20,000 BTU heater. To get 20,000 BTUs out of electric, I'd have to upgrade my electrical system and I just can't do that. So. This is also nice, um, as with electric, is that it's a simple on off. I turn a knob, it comes on, I turn a knob and it goes off and it's cooled down in a couple of minutes and it's, it's all safe in here. Meaning that there's nothing hot in here going while I'm not in here. I really like this option because I can come in here, turn the knob and it brings it up to temperature really quickly. In the neighborhood of like 20 minutes, this shop will go from like 45 degrees up to 60 degrees and I'll be able to come in here and almost a t-shirt be able to work. So I really like this option. Propane is a little bit cheaper for me to run if I buy the grill size uh, 20 pound propane tanks. My current fuel price for that is $3.99 a gallon. Now I can get that price down a whole lot if I buy it in bulk and hook this up to my bigger tank outside. I can, current, I can actually get that price down to about $2.44 a gallon for liquid propane which is a whole lot cheaper. It's actually the cheapest fuel source for me to run propane if I buy the propane in bulk. Now, in the future, possibly next year, I'll be moving my big uh, propane tank outside that's used to heat my house over to the other side, and I'll probably plumb in a hard line in order to run either this stove or a more uh, dedicated vented uh, propane stove. Now, there are some downsides to this heater. The first downside is that it is it's vent free, meaning that all of that smell, all of those gases go right into your workspace. Some people are more sensitive to the smell of the, uh, the propane burning. Um, I happen to be one of those people. 
Um, I, you can smell this. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You can smell. It's not a propane smell. It's not. It's just a propane burn exhaust smell. You can smell it. I don't care what you say. You can smell it. It's not malfunctioning. It just has a smell, and you can smell it. I personally can't deal with that smell for too long or I'll start getting headaches. And no, it's not the uh, the CO and all that stuff. I have CO detectors everywhere. I have like three of them in here. Um, I have the actual ones that give you an actual readout versus just the ones that say zero all the time. And if you've done any research on that, you'll know what I'm talking about. But anyway, these are completely safe to run. They have low oxygen shut off, so they are uh, completely safe to run indoors and all that jazz but they still smell and it's just that that burned gas smell that gives me problems if i run this all the time so i don't i basically just use it to bring the entire shop up the temperature because it's the most powerful heater that i currently have right now and then i turn it off it's all i need to bring this up to 60 degrees in here is 20 or 30 minutes with this running and i'm good to go the other issue with these and it's something that i haven't heard a lot of people talk about is they're very sensitive to dust these are not good in a dusty environment, and it's another reason why I don't like this running while I'm in here working, especially with the grinder or sanders. This is an open flame, and uh, basically, if you create any dust, the flame will start getting yellow because it'll start burning all of that dust in the air. The smell will get even worse because you're burning the dust and not just the propane, and uh, you'll have issues with this in a dusty environment. So my recommendation is, is if you're creating any sort of dust whatsoever, this is probably not gonna be a great option for you. But again, for me, bringing this up to temperature before I even come in here and heating the space up to a comfortable working temperature where I can let my other heater take over, which I'm gonna show you next, this thing works great. And I'm gonna be leaving it installed. Okay, so if you can't hear this thing, this is the last heater. And it's probably, this is probably my favorite heater. And I'm not just saying that. Uh, and first off, full disclosure, I didn't pay for this thing. I was going to, I was going to pay for it. I was gonna buy one, and then I remembered that the company that uh, actually sent this one to me reached out to me like a year ago, and I just never got back to them. So I got back to them, and they sent this thing to me to try out. And I've been using it now for the past uh, several weeks, and I really, I really, really like it. Um, this is actually probably the perfect heater setup for my garage. And I'm not really sure that I could even dream up of something that works better than this thing does for my particular situation. So first, uh, let me tell you about this. This is a Chinese diesel heater. There's a lot of videos on these things already on YouTube, um, and they've been making their rounds all over YouTube for the last year. And the, uh, I was actually gonna buy one, reached out to the, the company actually reached out to me about a year ago, wanted to send me one. I reached out to them and they sent me one. I said, hey, if you send me one and I like it, I'll show in a video. And here it is, I like it, so I'm gonna show it to you guys because I am using this and I'm, I've actually been really impressed with it. So first thing is this is the uh, uh, eight kilowatt unit from Viver. As far as I know, all of these are made in the same location and they're just branded differently through different manufacturers. Um, this is the eight kilowatt unit, the eight kilowatt unit, which is about 27,000 BTUs. This is not eight kilowatts. It's not 27,000 BTUs. No matter how you measure it, it's just not 27,000 BTUs. It does not use enough fuel for it to be 27,000 BTUs. You can't get more BTUs out of, um, you can't get more BTUs than the fuel has in it, if that makes sense. So it doesn't use 27,000 BTUs per hour worth of diesel fuel in order for it to be a 27,000 BTU um, heater. From what I've heard, from I haven't measured the exact fuel usage. I haven't done any experiments with it other than just pour diesel in it and see if it works. Um, but from the stuff that I've been reading, this is at full blast, this is about a 13,000 BTU, maybe 14,000 BTU unit. Um, based upon how much fuel it's actually consuming and the efficiency losses through the exhaust. Now, one, one reason that I've been using this is because it exhausts to the outside. I have this temporarily set up as a testing unit. Uh, once I start drywalling it here, I'm gonna set it up in a permanent manner, uh, which is probably gonna be outside. The whole unit's probably just gonna be outside. And then the vent here will actually pump the air inside. And then I have an intake on the other side, which will do the whole air exchange 
and that way the entire unit will be outside none of you won't see any of this inside but it does vent to the outside and that's really nice because there's zero smell i don't smell a single thing and all it puts out is just nice warm dry air out of this weird looking tube thing here now how i use this thing is uh it's pretty simple this little uh, control panel lets you dial up and dial down the heat it really goes from uh, very low to very well medium high you know again about 13,000 BTUs um, this thing's pretty much running all day long except for at night I shut it off um, in the mornings I come out I turn this thing on first thing it's usually 45 degrees in here or so with the temperature dropping down into the 20s at night and then uh, I let this run this will bring it back up to that uh, 50 55 degree mark and then to bring it up the rest of the way I'll turn on that propane stove for a couple minutes just heat everything in here uh, up nicely to that 60 degree and then shut that off and this thing will maintain that for the rest of the day then when I go back inside I'll dial this back down the temperature will drop back down to that 50 degree mark and then when I turn it off at night overnight it'll drop back down to about 45 degrees and then I start the whole process over it sounds complicated, but it's not. I'm only messing with this thing maybe three times a day. Once in the morning, once probably around noon time, it'll actually get too warm in here. I'll dial it back a little bit, um, depending on how warm the temperature is outside. And then once at night, I turn it off overnight and uh, the temperature maintains at 45 degrees and I'm pretty much done. So it's actually very little fiddling with this thing. And I thought it would be like a fiddly thing. So that's good news. This thing's actually meant to run off of a uh, 12 volt battery. Um, I have a uh, uh, AC to DC converter I bought off of Amazon for like 20 bucks and hooked it up. It's been working flawlessly. Like it's literally run, uh, I mean, even 18 hours a day for the last three weeks or so. And uh, I mean, it, it just continues to run. It's just like a clock and it sounds like a clock too. Now diesel fuel for me right now is not too terrible. It's about four bucks a gallon and it currently costs me about 36 cents per hour in order to run this thing on high. Uh, diesel fuel is actually cheaper for me to heat with than the electric is uh, by quite a bit. Um, and let me show you that right now. So here's how much all three of these fuel sources cost me to run per hour. Keep in mind, you may pay more or less for each one of these fuel sources, depending on where you live and what your prices are. Also, each one of these prices is for 3,412 BTUs per hour. So they're all comparative towards each other. And we're using 3,412 BTUs because that's how many BTUs is in one kilowatt hour of electricity, which is what we're starting with. So one kilowatt hour of electricity is equal to 3,412 BTUs per hour. So our three kilowatt heater that I showed you earlier is going to be 45 cents per hour to run. If we look at the more typical 7,500 watt heater, that's going to be 7.5 kilowatt hours of electricity. That's going to equal $3.37 per hour to run. So it ends up being, in my case, that it is just not worth uh, messing around with electricity. Next, we have propane. Propane has 91,500 BTUs per gallon of propane. Each gallon for a 20 gallon uh, grill sized propane tank cost me $3.99 per gallon. That equals 14 cents per 3,412 BTUs per hour. So it cost me, uh, for the same amount of BTUs per hour, it cost me 14 cents. So it's one cent cheaper than electricity if I buy it in the grill size propane tank. Now, if I buy it in bulk for my big tank uh, out back behind my house and I plumb a hard line into my shop, I can get it at $2.44 per gallon. At $2.44 per gallon, that would equal a nine cent per hour per 3,412 BTUs per hour. So propane is by far the cheapest fuel source for me to use if I buy it in bulk. Okay, now let's look at diesel. Diesel has 137,381 BTUs per gallon. My current price for off-road diesel is around $4 a gallon. That equals nine cents per 3,412 BTUs per hour. So diesel is actually tied with propane for the cheapest fuel source. But wait, that's not completely true because with diesel, we have an efficiency loss 
through the exhaust pipe, which is venting outside, versus propane, which vents its exhaust fumes inside. So I don't know exactly what the uh, efficiency of loss is, but we can say conservatively it's around 20%. So we're going to add about two cents back into the diesel price per hour to make up for that efficiency loss. So that brings us up to 11 cents per hour. Now you may be asking how I'm getting diesel fuel for $4 a gallon. This is off-road diesel, meaning it is not for automobile on highway use. It is for farm equipment and heating, and that's how you can get it cheaper. I happen to have a gas station about two miles up the road from me that sells off-road diesel, so the fuel source for me is very available, and it's probably the most convenient out of the other two. Aside from electricity, which I don't have to do anything for other than flip a switch, but it is just way too expensive to run. So now I've kind of showed you all of my different heating experiments in order to heat a 24 by 32 workspace. Uh, I'm going to be sticking with that diesel heater for the future and getting rid of my electric since it's way too expensive to run and I'm going to be using the gas stove just to bring it up to temperature. Now a lot of people are going to ask why I don't spend the money and just put a mini split in or why I don't put a wood stove in? I know I'm going to get those questions. So let me address the wood stove first. First, wood stove. I would love to have a wood stove in this space. It would be awesome. But the problem is, is that I just don't have the space for one. I have enough stuff in here already. A wood stove is going to take up an entire corner of the shop and I just don't have the space for it. Maybe one day when I get a big shop built, I can put a big wood stove in and heat the place for free, basically, other than cutting the wood. The other problem with the wood stove is that I'm in and out of this space a lot, and it's nice to be able to just have a button to turn the heat on and a button to turn the heat off. Well, the wood stove, once it's on, that puppy's on all day, you're not turning it off, you're not making it completely safe um, for you know the better part of eight hours, maybe even more. So if you're constantly in and out of your shop, which I am, uh, it might not be super uh, ideal to have a wood stove in your shop because you just can't turn it on and turn it off. It's, it's hot, and once that puppy's hot, it's gonna be hot for a long time. So that's kind of the reason why, for me, a wood stove isn't an option. Now, the other option that I have is a mini split because I do actually plan on uh, uh, air conditioning in this space as well. And the problems that I found with mini splits are, for one, they're very expensive. Um, for a unit that works in my climate, it's gonna cost around 2,500 bucks. Um, I need a low temperature, high pressure unit. I think that that's what the deal is with those. I need something that's gonna be able to heat down to minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, a traditional heat pump system is just not gonna work in our climate that we're in. And uh, yeah, those are just more expensive units. So $2,500 for the unit, and then I can install it or I'd pay to have someone install it, but that's even more money on top of the unit price itself. And that's for one of the cheaper units. And the problem is with a lot of those cheaper units is they just don't have great track records, especially those higher pressure systems. Um, I've seen a lot of corrosion issues with them. I've seen a lot of uh, warranty issues with them, warranty issues that never go through. The warranty claim is either denied or the company is unreachable or you're on hold for 19 hours. and you just can't do that. You just can't mess around without heat for three weeks while you're waiting to get a part from warranty. So for me personally, in this space, I like smaller, simpler heaters that if it breaks, I can buy a new one and it's here in two days. Like it's not a big deal. The amount of money that these things cost is less than the amount of a maintenance fee, a simple hourly one hour worth of maintenance fee. So the price issue is huge. And efficiency wise, they're just not as efficient as a lot of people make them out to be, especially considered the, considering the higher price tag involved. $2,500 is a lot of money. I can buy a lot of diesel fuel for $2,500. And if it takes 10 or 15 years to pay for itself, by that time, the mini split unit is not going to be cost efficient whatsoever. So uh, they're, just, they're just not e as efficient units as I think most people think they are, especially considering the maintenance uh, and upkeep costs associated with them. You're never ever gonna get your money back on one of those units in a space like this.